Hi, everybody. This is Kevin Sabrin with Rethinking Everything and the Rethinking Everything Dad blog. I'd like to uh, welcome you to the program today, as well as our uh, good friend and special guest, John Strelecki. Hi, John. How's it going, Kev? Fantastic. Thanks for joining us. Always a treat to be visiting with you, my friend. We go back a few years here. And uh, I think lots maybe, of scenarios, lots of campfires. <laughs> absolutely. I think one of the best ways to start this is. Do you, I have to, I'll ask you, and then I'll tell a short story, but do you remember, well, you clearly remember your article about the uh, lessons of the green sea turtle. Do you remember right. that part of the story with us? I do, yeah, that, that does go way back. That probably goes more than 10 years back. So, can you, do you want to tell, uh, uh, just give us a top line on that story. Do you mind sharing that with us, your, what the story was about that you wrote in the essay? Yeah, sure. So it's, uh, it's interesting as an author, you, you tend to get feedback from people about, Oh, like that was the favorite part of my store of your book, or like, that's the part I remember the most. So in the Y cafe, the first book that I wrote, there is the story of the sea turtle and, uh, the, the main character in the book learns this incredibly powerful life lesson as one of the other characters is sharing the story. And the essence is that, uh, the character is snorkeling and sees the sea turtle and is like, Oh my God, a sea turtle. I can't believe it and tries to sort of stay with the sea turtle and finds that she can't. And she's snorkeling, but the sea turtle's moving and the currents and all the rest of that. And so she can't figure that out. She's like, it's a turtle, right? How can I not keep up with a turtle? But what she learns the next day when she comes back and sees the sea turtle again is that sea turtles are very conscious of their movements. And so when the current is in their face, the waves are coming directly at them. And for anybody who's ever swam in the ocean, you can totally understand this, right? There is a natural ebb and flow. Uh, in water in the, the ocean and so when, when you're trying to move right the sea turtle is very connected with all that ebb and flow and so it will not fight the current constantly it will wait for the calm and in the calm then it'll use its flippers and paddle 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 and then when the wave is in its face it just sort of holds ground right like i know there's going to be a calm i know there's going to be an ebb and then sure enough the ebb comes goes crazy and that's why the turtle moves so quickly in the water um, but the person who was snorkeling was just constantly bah, 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 and can't keep up. So the life lesson in there for the character is if you are constantly going a thousand miles an hour uh, in the face of the waves, then when the ebb comes or when the opportunity comes, you have no time and you have no energy to actually really give it momentum because you're just too exhausted and you've burned up all your time. And so that's kind of the, that's the part of the story that so many people come up to me and they're like, oh my God, I got sea turtle pictures on my wall or I got sea turtle stuffed animals to remind me, listen, it's ebb and flow, right? So move when there's flow and just chill when there's, or yeah, move when there's flow in the direction I want to go and just sort of chill when it's in my face. So at that same time in my life, I was working for a large corporation in the uh, Midwest and I had endured uh, basically a week long of meetings where yeah, the particular room that we were in for these meetings had no windows. It was smack in the middle of this huge corporate campus. And uh, it was a fairly contentious kind of angry vibe where, you know, a bunch of people were rooted in some beliefs and ideas on how things should go, myself included, never short of an opinion. I had my own side that I squared off on. And after three or four days of just sort of overwhelming ick, I came home from this meeting. Of course, I was away from, you know, my family and my wife and kids and uh, came home after three or four long days sit down in a chair, just put my feet up and I'm ready to relax. And my wife, Kelly, brings me this article that John's just referring to. And she said, you look like you need this. And it looked like that, you know, that you, you look like you need this felt like, oh, here comes another heavy topic. Here comes, I don't have the mental capacity or the emotional bandwidth to take on something else right now. Like, no, I don't want this. So just read it. Just read it. I'm like, I don't want to read this article. I like, don't want to read it. And she, then one more time, listen, this isn't for me. I'm not like going to make you, you know, take on another project or, you know, do some more heavy lifting. This is for you. Read this. And it was this article that John's speaking about. And immediately I got the point that, you know, I was this sea turtle flailing away rather than taking my moment to, to make my dive or make my move, wait for the stars align and then take the deep dive, you know, flow with it, go with the flow, as they say. Um, it immediately clicked. I told Kelly, this is fantastic. Do we know this author? Have we read anything else on this? And she's like, I don't know. I'll go Google it. She went upstairs and Googled some things and found some other stuff. And we ordered the Y Cafe. After reading the Y Cafe, Kelly reached out. I think we'd read some other things that you had online on your website at that point. And after that, she sent you a note. And uh, she didn't know she was sending it to you. It was just sort of a, you know, kind of a blind contact us box. And uh, 
unbeknownst to her, John had actually gotten back with her and was dialoguing with Kelly, sharing some uh, stories and new material to read. It was fantastic. So this friendship formed over my bad experience and John's epiphany with the green sea turtle. And consequently, the friendship ensued. And we even have a green a, a sea turtle in our logo today for the Rethinking Everything conference. So quite a friendship and a long story. Well, and there's, there's so many great gems as I hear you telling that story. Now we can look at it from a 10 year, more than 10 year past perspective. Uh, but so many great life lessons in that experience of when you're in the midst of something that is not going as you expected, uh, the, the ability to step back from that and say, what is in this for me, right? Is this something that I can learn from this experience? Uh, my favorite modification to a small verbal twist is it's very easy when these things are happening to be like, why is this happening to me, right? Uh, and if you just tweak that just a little bit and just say, huh, so, so why is this happening? And that's not always easy to do, depending on the severity of the moment. But I can tell you that so many times in my life when I've been able to step back from it, even if I, even if I have to fake it at the time, right? yeah. <laughs> just be like, no, I, I'm approaching this from the perspective of there's got to be a reason for it and I'll learn something, that if I can step back far enough, I can see there's a connectedness, there's a reason to it. And uh, yeah, you could have never known after that week of you know, typical corporate bullshit that you're going to have to, yeah. something good will come out of it, but something did. So, well, I used to use the airplane time for that, the buffer, I always call it, you know, as I transition away from home life and family to whatever I was engaging in the work world, the airplane ride out and the airplane ride back were often, those were, you know, my time. And, uh, yeah. the very first few trips after, uh, you know, this incident I'm talking about with this essay that I read, I had one of your books and specifically, I remember reading life safari. Now this is fast forwarding a while because life safari came out later, but, uh, no spoiler alerts here, but there happens to be a poignant scene with a sunset. And uh, I remember um, flying home during the sunset as, you know, I'm reading the book and uh, or one in one of the many scenes. And it was just like, it just brought it all home for me, you know, planes landing. And uh, it was really, really cool. So those buffer sure. times and, uh, you know, the inspiration that came from the books and the works were, were really special to me. So again, I thank you, even though I've Sure, I've said that many times. Thank you again. Um, Why Cafe, you mentioned. Um, Why Cafe and the, the PFE, um, Purpose for Existence. Can you tell me where that came from for you, that concept? Yeah, the, the whole, I mean, the essence of the Why Cafe was a very unique experience. I had left the world behind, um, left a very successful career behind. It, I was good at what I did. I was well paid for what I did. I just didn't have a heart connection to what I did. And so there came a time when I said, I just can't do this anymore. Uh, and so I was willing to, to let everything go. I didn't care if I would have to pay for it the rest of my life, but I was going to go off and see the world. And so my wife and I had been married for all of six weeks. And through a series of crazy circumstances that would make a spectacular Dilbert cartoon, um, I, I left my career temporarily. And uh, we went off and saw the world and backpacked around the world for $40 a day. As you know, when people get me started on the topic of travel and they say, oh, I want to travel the world. I say, great. All you got to do is figure out a way to get $40 a day. And whether that's you're teaching English somewhere else, and I know I'll be doing a session, or I'll, if I'm not doing a session specifically about it, I'll certainly be having a, and I think I'm doing a session about it and traveling the world in $40 a day that's correct. Uh, this year at RE. And so uh, when people tell me that that's one of my dreams, of course, I'm like, okay, so let's craft out an experience for you to make that your reality. Um, because when you do those things, it opens up a space. And the space for me was I came back from backpacking around the world for a year, had a stream of conscious typing experience, which became the Y Cafe. And as part of that book is this concept of PFE, your purpose for existence. Um, the essence of it is quite simple, Kev. It's, it's, statistically speaking, you're going to get 28,900 days on the planet. And you hope it's more, sometimes it's less. 900. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> we're getting older, right? And so you start doing the math on that and you multiply your age by 365, you subtract from 28,900. And statistically speaking, that's how many days you've got left. And you know, the days at the end, I, I, I see my parents getting older and the challenges that come with that, the physical challenges and uh, illness challenges. And so I don't think the days at the end are necessarily always the best ones, those last five years. Not that you want to subtract those off, but it's not the same run and gun lifestyle. Right. And so you start to realize, like, my days are kind of important, and they're slipping by quickly. And then for me, the big question was, so why am I here? 
you know, like, I mean, the, the powerful moment for me happened on a beach in Costa Rica. I was, I had been in the corporate world. I had been trying to make it as a professional beach volleyball player. I was getting my MBA. Uh, my schedule, my life was nonstop schedule. And, and I remember sitting on a beach in Costa Rica, my first time overseas and watching the waves crash against the beach and saying, Oh my God, like this has been going on for millions, if not billions of years. Clearly my little place in the universe is not all that important. Uh, so why am I here? And that's where the concept of PFE came from. What is my purpose for existence? If I've got 28,900 days on the planet, what am I going to do with them and why? Well, being that our birthdays are a week apart, it's probably no surprise to you that we're about uh, 57% of the way through that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We've got to get busy. <laughs> it starts, well, you know, what's funny is that when you, when you are in your 20s, it doesn't, like, you, you have, the, at least I did, I had this sense of immortality, or it'll be around forever, and then 30s was a little bit less of that, and then, uh, then you start to have kids, and kids provide this whole other we did we had a child and so you start to see them grow up and then that gives you a whole new perspective on how fast you're aging because you see how quickly they're growing and then to me the other thing is that I, I used to have all these aunts and uncles and my dad's relatives that I used to see at holiday parties and the rest of that and they're almost all gone yeah you know and these are the guys that I would when I was a kid I used to go on fishing trips and it was me and I was always the youngest guy right by far I was the, I was the kid most of them have passed away. Thank, thank goodness my dad is still here, but he's, he's older now. And I've realized that, you know what? I'm starting to get to the top of the pyramid. <laughs> I'm about to be the oldest guy on the fishing trip now, right? And so all this stuff sort of, it changes your perspective on things. To me, it gives me a kick in the ass that says, it's very important to me that I do what I came here to do, whatever that is, right? If it's to, to be a great father, then every morning I need to be a great father because that's what I came here to do. If it's to do something entrepreneurial, then do it. Because I don't want to get to the end and the end is just around the corner. I see it. I don't want to get to the end and be like, oh, I totally could have done that or I wish I would have done that or I should have done that. No, thank you. No, no thanks. I can't get there and have that be the end. Um, do you mind sharing about the story that happened yesterday? Uh, sure. 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 I think you're talking about creating great father, uh, father moments. If that happens to be in the wheelhouse of the big five there. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So you mentioned the big five. Um, let me briefly explain what that is for the folks who aren't perhaps familiar with that. So, uh, as the Y cafe started to take off, people asked me, would you do speaking engagements? Would you come and talk to our, our company, our organization? And I was like, Oh my God, like I had no plans to be an author, let alone a speaker. I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. Right. And uh, I had this very powerful epiphany one morning. and It was based on an experience that we had when we were traveling around the world. One of the places that we went, which totally changed my life, was Africa. And in Africa, people talk about the African Big Five, and it's these five animals that people want to see. And they consider their safari to be a success based on if they see these five animals, right? And so my epiphany as I was preparing to do some of these speaking events was, well, what if we started to look at our lives completely differently, right? What if we were to say, what are the five things that I most want to do, see, or experience during my lifetime? And those are your personal big five for life. And then you were to restructure your time, your energy, your financial resources, the way you spend everything, all of your resources, <clears throat> and direct it towards those five things. And those are your personal big five for life. And then you, it's very easy then all of a sudden because now when something comes here, it's sort of like the Velcro wall of life, right? So opportunity comes your way. Hey, John, we'd like you to take this new, <clears throat> new job, new consulting assignment. And you take the Velcro wall of life and you throw it up against your big five or this opportunity, you throw it up against your big five for life. And, oh, it's not one of my big five for life. Thank you, but no thank you, right? Or, oh, sticks right on the wall, right? Fantastic. It's part of my big five for life. I'll go do it. And so it becomes very simple. Life becomes a lot less stressful because there's none of this should I, shouldn't I? Does it make sense? Do I want to spend my money on this? Do I want to spend my time on this? Um, it's very cut and dry, very simple. And so for me, one of my personal big five for life is a loving relationship with my daughter. Um, and so I made the decision when she was two that no matter what else was going on, twice a week, all day was daddy daughter day. And we would hit parks and it didn't have to be big things, right? But just stuff, just time together. And, uh, you know, I started when she was just two years old I, and now she's, she's big, right? And so I, I can... I have to think back and remember I was looking at pictures and like, Oh my God, that was the days when I could like pick her up, like, you know, <laughs> throw her up in the air and catch her. Right. Yeah. Um, 
but so we continue that today, even though she's a, she's a big kid now. And so yesterday we had just a spectacular experience where we had a daddy daughter fishing day with another little friend of hers and a father. And in addition to fishing, we were just standing on a sandbar. And as we're standing on the sandbar, we had a manatee come up. There was four of them. It was a mother, a baby, and then another two big ones. They literally came up and wrapped their, their flippers around us as we were standing on this sandbar. And this, uh, this little girl, uh, so Sophia's friend, this little girl just kept saying, this can't be happening. This cannot be happening. <laughs> Unreal. Yeah. So it's the kind of thing that when you, when you decide to yourself, I'm going to move in the direction of my personal big five for life, you don't know exactly the ways in which that will manifest, right? You can't guarantee, oh, what are the experiences I'm going to have along the way as it relates to that, right? So if you say, I'm going to travel the world as one of my big five for life. But what you find is that the experiences you do have far exceed anything you could have possibly imagined. Right. So when I said, oh, I want to have a loving relationship with my daughter, I couldn't have said, oh, that means we're going to have a manatee hug us on this day, right? But when you open up that space and you make that commitment, I find that there is just something else that happens. And you can define it however you want. You can say it's God. You can say it's the universe, whatever your term is. But you activate something in the universe that says this is important to me. Right. And therefore, good things happen. Sit back and watch the gifts show up. That was ama it's an amazing story. For those of you that aren't Floridians or have ever, you know, maybe haven't seen a manatee before, these are enormous animals. I mean, we're talking five to 1,000 pounds, 500 to 1,000 pounds kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, like a, it's like a hippo coming up and giving you a hug. I mean, <laughs> a hippo with flippers. <laughs> a hippo with flippers is about right, too. Right. A little, little less aggressive. Oh, I love it. Well, that's a terrific story. So um, now you're talking about uh, Y Cafe. And uh, you have a new, uh, the sequel to the Y Cafe is out now. How's that doing? Well, how are you feeling about that? Yeah, it's been a great experience. Uh, so it launched overseas before it actually came out here in the U.S. It's just come out in the last week here in the U.S. Uh, it's called Return to the Y Cafe. And, uh, but it's, it's doing very, very well. It opened six weeks ago in uh, Europe and it opened on the bestseller list as the number one lifestyle book. And uh, it's continued to stay on there for the last six weeks, continuing uh, to make great strides. So it's really cool to see the reaction from readers and to get their emails. And uh, I've had many people tell me they like it better than the original Y Cafe, which after the success of the Y Cafe, that's hard to, hard to get my hands around, but we'll see. Good for you. That's fantastic. You have a really, uh, you have an amazing international following. And I've been curious about that. I don't know if I've ever asked you about it, but what's the, what's the common denominator? Is, it, is there a lifestyle difference in sort of the European or Asian mind frame that uh, makes certain groups want to reach for this information more quickly than other demographics? You know, what's totally cool is I, so the books are in 25 languages at this point. And if you looked at the map of the world, it's, it's Asia, it's Europe, it's all around the world right. for those 25. And it, it doesn't seem to matter whether it is, um, I guess across cultures, the message seems to connect with people. So it's been a number one bestseller on three continents. And so you would say, well, if it was just something specific to the American culture, there's no way it would translate, right, to a European culture or Asian culture. Um, but to me, what's very, very cool about this is that the concept of living a life in alignment with your heart, living a life doing the things that you want to do, it seems to be, it, it transcends cultures, it transcends geographies, it's human. And, and I actually think it goes beyond human, too. I think it's, if, if we could somehow communicate with a dolphin, I think you'd find the same type of discussion. The dolphin would be like, what are you doing sitting in that cubicle all day that you hate? Like, <laughs> There's a whole ocean out here, right? Come play. There's a whole right. continent out there. Go walk for a while. Um, right. Because I really do think that on a, a higher evolved level of consciousness and intelligence, you know, there's this opportunity to be in alignment with who you authentically are. And uh, that transcends almost everything else. Well, I love that uh, Big Five gives you a framework or a filtering mechanism to be able to identify with that. You hear a lot of talk about alignment and resonance and, you know, making those decisions about those things that resonate or being in alignment with what my true uh, desires are is really about getting clear with what those things are first and yeah. maybe ruling out what isn't. So, you know, in the what isn't requires contrast. So, you know, I know I've experienced plenty of contrast in my life. I know a lot of things that are isn't or that aren't. And uh, it help, does help me get clear with what is. So um, the, the big five can also evolve. This, uh, 
the concept of the big five. I mean, I imagine over your uh, years of uh, thinking on big five in big five terms, you've probably reinvented big five a few times, right? Yeah. So first I want to jump back to something you said, which is really, really important. And that is, so I, I, I have a big five for life discovery course experience that people go through. So after the big five for life came out and the Y cafe had been out life safari had been out, people would say, well, John, I totally want to get clear about my purpose in life, about my personal, because to set context, the, your purpose is the overarching reason that you're here. Think of it as a, almost like, oh, here's a better analogy. So a river, right? So I want to be on the live an amazing life river, right? Or make a difference in the lives of others river, whatever your purpose is. And the question is, so great. What are you going to do Monday morning, right? Uh, in the context of the river, what ports of call are you going to stop at along the way? So if I'm on the live an amazing life river, oh, well, that means I'm going to build homes in Guatemala and I'm going to do an entrepreneurial venture. And what are these other things that are going to be these ports of call in the river? And so as you can imagine, to your point about stopping the things that aren't working, if you're on, if you say to yourself, I want to be on the live an amazing life river but I'm permanently docked at the job that sucks port of call. <laughs> it is very hard to get quality time on the live an amazing life river. And what's interesting is that I've really given this a lot of thought and this has now become crystal clear in my mind that we live in a, what I call a benevolent universe. And so we are creatures of free will, right? If we want to do something, we do it. If we don't, we don't. And so it seems to be part of the algorithm that says, well, whatever you're spending a lot of time on must be what you want. And therefore, because I'm a benevolent universe or a benevolent God, I will give you more of that. And so if you're docking at the job that sucks port of call and you're spending 60 hours a week there, the benevolent universe says, my gosh, Kev must love that place. Look at how much time he spends there. I'll give him more of that because I'm a benevolent presence, right? And he's a creature of free will. And so the next thing you know, 60 turns into 65 and then 70 and then 80 hours a week at this port of call that sucks. The only way to get out of this is to stop spending time at that port of call, which is the genius that you just said. So even if you don't know where else you want to go on the river, stop spending time on that one, right? And this can be applied in so many simple and easy ways in life. If you don't know what you want to do with your life, just take, take this week and find five minutes a day that you're going to stop doing something that you can't stand doing. And if you do nothing else other than just sit outside and watch the sky for those five minutes, hey, that's better than being docked at the port of call, which is this thing sucks. Yep. That's fantastic. Yeah. So sometimes it's about stopping what you don't like doing so that you can open up space to figure out what you do want to do. Well, you know... Um a couple of things came to mind while you're saying that was um, the uh, well, you mentioned Costa Rica earlier and the turtle and the story. We shared an experience in Costa Rica. We actually uh, vacationed together for a while uh, at a, a terrific place in Costa Rica. And we had a, a conversation there about faith and fear. And I noticed that in the stopping, uh, there's a lot, sometimes a lot of fear, you know, and maybe if that fear could be replaced with faith that, you know, I'll have the faith that, uh, that a better outcome will be uh, forthcoming. It, but, you know, I have to get over my fear of stopping because there is this uh, tension a lot of people carry about, I can't stop, I can't possibly stop. There's already not enough time in the day. How do I take five minutes away or what have you? So how about faith and fear? And how does that play into people's initial ability to actually start or stop, depending on how you look at it? Yeah. So unfortunately, what happens is um, for most people, they wait until the situation gets so bad that they just can't take it anymore. And then they will enact change. Right. And so this is the classic example of the person who is um, living a life in a very stressful way, no matter what that means. It could be in a stressful job. It could be just the way they approach life. You know, this is the person who's constantly pissed off because somebody cuts them off on the road or everybody's out to get them or the kids are kind of trying to micromanage the kids every single second. Right. So life is just overall stressful. But they convince themselves, we convince ourselves, because I've been in that position, that it can't be changed. However, right, then when you're on the way to the hospital in the ambulance because your heart is palpitating and you don't know why and you're laying on the kitchen floor and the uh, paramedics are there, you make a very conscious choice. Something is going to change that day. Right? Yeah. And you find the courage to make that change. And you hear this all the time. Someone who has a heart attack and then I, I, they quit their job the next day. Right? I can't do that anymore. 
So unfortunately, culturally, we are raised in an environment that says that's the time to make the decision, right? But the problem is that those are called near-death experiences. And the problem with having a near-death experience is you get very close to death. And sometimes you get so close that you die. And <laughs> there is no going back then, right? There's no, oh, well, now I'll make the changes I want to make. And so the trick is to convince your unconscious mind that this new reality is worth giving a shot to. And so what you're describing, this concept of fear versus faith, comes into play. So you can help your mind, your unconscious mind, get over fear, and you can supplement that with faith. So here's how you help the unconscious mind get over fear. The, the short end, I do a, I'll do a long stint of this at RE because it's a really cool way to help people deal with it, but I'll give you the very, very short version here. Uh, the short version is you sample. And the unconscious mind slowly gets comfortable with things. And so let's say that you wanted to... Um, you wanted to move out of your neighborhood. Yeah, let's say you live in a house. I know some, some folks who have been at RE have done this type of adventure. You, you want to sell your house, get into an RV, and go travel the country for a while. Right? This may sound vaguely familiar to the Saber family. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so at the start, your unconscious mind is like, no effing way. Yeah. Right? Because I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about RVs. I don't know anything about spending my life on the road. No effing way. And you've got an entire cultural conditioning that says, this is what success is. Success is living in this house, in a neighborhood, where I'm out there watering my lawn on Fridays, right? And whether or not that's actually true, you've seen it on television, you maybe saw it as a child, somebody gave you a random data point as you were growing up, and said, that's, that's what the American dream is right there, right? You may have the American dream, and they show a picture of a house with a white picket fence. Whether you consciously accepted that or not, it's in there. And so the trick is to help what's in your brain get used to a new reality. So you can do this in sampling phases. And so if you literally just for five minutes a day for one week, start either looking on YouTube, looking at a magazine, reading a book, something that has to do with our being, right? If that was the dream, what happens is the unconscious mind is looking at these pictures of these images. And of course, in addition to the fact that there's an RV in the picture and this beautiful scenery, there's also people. And so your unconscious mind starts going, oh, well, look, there's people and we're a person, therefore this is potentially possible. And you start establishing new neural pathways in the brain, which get the brain comfortable with this possible new reality. And it's so amazing when you start to get into the, neuro I'm a huge fan of neuroscience. And so when you start to get into the decision making and human potential aspects of this, you start to realize how simple this stuff is. So not only is it important that your brain is seeing pictures of people, right? Yeah. But you being a guy, Kev, when the picture has a, a man, right, and it's a Caucasian man, right. your brain starts making all these connections, right? Because it sees, oh, my God, there's a guy. We're a guy. There's a Caucasian guy. I'm a Caucasian guy. If you somehow knew what your ancestral lineage was to Europe or Irish or whatever, right, and there was some tie in that to the picture, oh, there's green grass. Oh, that's kind of like Ireland. I'm Irish. The brain does all this for you. Interesting. Yeah. And so what I do is I put limits on people. I tell them for a week, all you can do is five minutes a day, right? So you actually then create demand. The unconscious mind is going, no, but I like that. I like looking at these pictures. It's making me feel good. And so then you go from five minutes to 10 minutes to an hour. And again, I'll do this whole sequence at RE and help people get through that. But the point is that you can help the brain go from the state of panic and fear to a position where it actually is crying out and demanding to do this. Now, how do you supplement that with faith? That's super easy, and you've heard me teach this many, many times. Fear comes from how do I do that, right? I don't know how to do that. It's a state of the unknown. So the way to get over that is to use what I call the who technique. And the who technique is simply who's already out there doing, seeing, and experiencing what you want to do, see, and experience? Because somebody is, right? Whether it's RVing. I mean, RVing is easy. There's probably, what, 100,000 people right now somewhere in this country sitting in an RV. And so when you start looking at who's already doing it, then it becomes a matter of faith. Well, if they can do it, we can do it. Right. Right. You're not, you're not the first one to go chart the South Pole, right? <laughs> this is not the unknown. Right. This is simply a matter of, oh, I just, all I have in front of me is to find someone who already knows what they're doing and ask them, what do I do? And how is it that, you know, what is it that you do that enables you to be successful? So those two things together, unbelievable. I get the uh, cognitive and emotional parts of the um, faith and fear. 
I have an example, a short story I want to share about the physical and just uh, see if that changes any thinking. Um, the, uh, early days, sports, uh, exercise, working out, uh, in anyone's uh, progression of exercise, especially if you're using free weights, there's this point where you're going to hit a number that's a psychological barrier. And mm -hmm. my experience is it's either a round number, like if you're squatting or bench pressing or you're doing some of these physical moves, uh, it's either going to be a round number that's an intimidating number or it's a visually, uh, uh, it visually affects you, like the number of, like say, plates you would put on a bar. And I'll never forget uh, in early days of uh, football, uh, working out that there was two barriers around the 300 pound milestone for the big guys or bench pressing. The first was um, to hit 300 pounds on a bench press. You actually have to have the two 45 pound plates on each side and a 35 pound plate, which is an ominous amount of weight there. But you also have to put a little tiny two and a half pound plate on both sides. <laughs> so, you know, being able to press, you know, two 45s and two and a 35 on each side is a, is a monster amount of weight. The tiny little two and a half pounders are meaningless almost, but the the mental block that that creates is like I, you know the three hundred pound seems insurmountable, right? And then you know so you have to push past that, and then um, a mere uh, fifteen pounds later you hit your second major milestone, and that's when you have to put three plates on both sides. The visual effect of seeing those three plates is just is unreal. So um, a strength coach came in and talked to a bunch of us about. Um, how to manage this. And he said, put four plates on and just lift the bar, lift the actual bench press bar up in the air. Don't try to bring it down to your chest. Just push it up in the air. See if you can get six inches of lift between you and that uh, even more ominous amount of weight. And when a bunch of young people, young guys did that, it was within a, you know, a few days, if not a week that almost everybody would, had surpassed the threshold. And it wow. was just the, the reaching for something that seems so out there just to know that you can do it it almost lifted this mental block that whether it's the 300 pound, which requires those little tiny two and a half, or whether it's the big three plate stack, it was amazing to me how, you know, uh, encouraging the brain in that way. It was like, Oh yeah, your body has now experienced this. So how about, how about the physical experience to remind you that you can do it too? You know, yeah, so what you're talking about was a great example. Uh, so I was using the example of traveling in an RV. You gave a great example there of doing something physical. The same concepts apply. So you use sampling. Uh, and the sampling is, I don't want you to do the whole thing. I just want you to do six inches, right? Just, I want you to just move that, hold the bar, and I want you to move the bar. Right? That's probably seven seconds, eight seconds of effort. Right. And so the unconscious mind starts to get comfortable with that and sees that other people can do that too. All right. And we play on the same team. Right. So it starts to make all of these neural connections. And so without a doubt that adding in the physical element, the reason that I don't add in the physical element at the start is because I want to create that demand. I want the brain to be wanting to do this. So in the example of uh, going on an RV, the physical activity would be, well, if you've never been in an RV, like go stand in one. So I'll go to the RV dealership and go stand in one. But I don't want the person to do that on day one. Because it would just absolutely blow apart the circuitry in the brain. It'd be way too much. Right? I see. And that's not everybody because there's other people who are just pure impulse. So they would be the type of person who goes into the RV lot, drops $100,000, now owns an RV and has no idea what to do with the thing. But the same result would follow because they would get the RV home yeah. and it would never leave the path. Because the fear would kick in, but the fear would kick in after they've already done the impulse. Right. Right. It totally makes sense. I get that. We've been on both sides of that continuum, unfortunately. We've been out there and made those big purchases too. Yeah, I can see that at the point when ultimately the faith or fear paths have to be decided. You've done the pre-work. You've got clear about what it is that you want and you've wrestled with the fear. I can see we're adding in that as a last layer. The physical side of it is now go immerse yourself or experience it. Rent one for a weekend. Whatever it is, you know, after you've talked to your who, yeah, go rent one and and uh, and try it on. And, you know, make sure that the path does fit. Yeah, um, and if you if you do it if you do it with the right spacing, right? And it requires a level of patience. But if you do it with the right spacing, you should. In essence, the whole experience will be not fear. There should be no fear based element to it at all. We um, we went to Peru, as you know, earlier this year, and we spent three months in Cusco, Peru, and we ran a bed and breakfast. Had a fantastic time. Um, we immersed ourselves in the culture and the land and the history and really, really enjoyed it. 
the special part, we did it very creatively because we took over an existing business. Basically, we were innkeepers or house sitters, if you will. And we managed somebody's business. It was uh, We talked to you about this idea before we did it. We <laughs> through a, a process of uh, alignment where you kind of helped me walk through uh, a decision tree. How does this feel? Is this in alignment? How could this work? So ultimately, we got clear with it. And we went and we did it. And we had a wonderful time. While we were there, we met, I, I counted once, 12 or 14 different families that were in some stage of an around the world trip. <laughs> and um, what struck me was the common denominator that all of these families were uh, unplugging from something. And they were in the midst of this, as I mentioned, around the world travel. And uh, it, it, what struck me was that nobody seemed to have a plan after the travel was over. Right. And it really felt to me like they needed, maybe it could have benefited from a little big five type critical thinking. Uh, somewhere in there, the alignment was secondary and just this launch, this, this freedom. It's like the, it's like the uh, I don't want to say this is universally true, that nobody had a plan, but uh, the plan was being determined while they were out there. Um, you know what I'm saying? It was like, okay, the money's out. Now we're going to go home and start over. And are we going to go start over the way we were just doing it? Or are we going to do something different? And it felt like maybe some guidelines might've been helpful or. Yeah, it's a bouncing. Act. I think when you, again, this goes back to a lot of times the goal is, uh, it's not something we've talked about here, but I know it's something that you and I have talked about offline before. And so when the situation is bad enough that you want to leave it, often what happens is people are saying, well, I'm going to run away from this. And ideally, they have something that they're going at least in the direction of, but the goal is really away from. And so I hate my job. I just want to quit that job. I'm leaving that job. Right? And so in the interim, I'm going to go do something else. If in the long term, there's never something that you're running towards, then you, you fail in your true potential. And, and people, when they look at their lives, would say the same thing. They would say, oh, geez, I was so busy running away from that thing that I hated. I never really took the opportunity to run towards the thing that I wanted. And so uh, I think it's a balancing act of if you say, you know what, my goal for a year is just to go out there and see the world. And maybe everything else is so convoluted that you just need to open up that space and go see the world. And then you'll figure out the rest after that. Right. Perfect. Right. That's um, like that five minutes you were talking about earlier, the five minutes a day on a grand scale. Yeah. Uh, wonderful, though, is when you have the prescience to step back from that, even in the midst of it for a little bit and say, this is pretty spectacular stuff. Therefore, how do I create an opportunity? What is my opportunity? Who is out there creating an opportunity to not just have this be a one-off? I'm good until I run out of money and then I got to go back to that. Instead say in what, and who is my who out there that is creating an environment where they get to do this all the time. Right. And the, the analogy that I use for that, which is so true, you know, here in the States, typically people have a week or two weeks of vacation. And if they're working at a job that's very stressful, they get their one week of vacation, they head down to the Caribbean, or they head down to Mexico in an all-inclusive on Playa del Carmen down there, right? Yep. And they're sitting on the beach. And for the first two days, all they're trying to do is to stop thinking about work, right? It's literally taking them two days to not go through, to go through withdrawal of not, you know, they, I can't check my pager, I can't check my or pager, that's old technology. Can't check my iPhone, I can't check my email. Like, you know, oh my God. <clears throat> and worse now is that every place probably has Wi Fi, so they are feeling like they can check their email. Um, and so for those first two days, it's kind of like withdrawal from work. Then finally, on day three of the seven days, they're starting to be like, wow, I could like really get used to this feeling of being relaxed, right? And I don't have to get up at a specific time every day, and I enjoy my time during the day. And so then about day four or five, they're really sort of in the groove of this is awesome right like i feel zero stress i like i'm not thinking about work i'm like just enjoy i played volleyball today i went for a walk on the beach for crying out louder but then on day six they start thinking about oh my god only two more days i'm gonna be back at the job and so all they're doing then is thinking about what's waiting for it. let me get an email let me just handle a few emails now so that when i get back it's not that bad right and so unfortunately when we have just these short gaps of time what rarely occurs is the opportunity to say, what's the path to make this feeling my everyday feeling? And that requires really stepping out long enough. And 
to your point about, so let's say a family goes away for a year. During a year, there's a lot of time to consciously be thinking, what's the way I can make this my life? But if you're always a little bit looking in the rear view mirror and saying, well, when the money runs out, I just got to go back, right? You miss a huge opportunity to open up that specter of possibility. Yeah, that seems right to me. Um, you uh, mentioned something a second ago about the, um, you know, so work-life balance is a perennial topic at the SUDS events and men's nights and uh, really just this gathering in general. And uh, you've got a session coming up at the conference this year, how to get paid and not work. Right. You know, work being a loaded word. Can you tell us just the top line on that? Sure. So it actually ties in many, many of the concepts we've been talking about. <clears throat> and that is that if you uh, just sort of scan the horizon of the majority of people out there, you find that most people do not have a heart connection to the job that they do. And so they necessar don't necessarily enjoy that part of their life. Um, that's challenging because 70% of people's awake life like Monday through Friday is typically spent at work getting to work or thinking about work. And so when you look at your life and you say, wow, like that huge chunk of my time is spent on this job thing. Right. If you don't enjoy that, if that doesn't fulfill your life's purpose, if it's not in alignment with your personal big five for life, there's a conflict there. It's an emotional conflict. It's a neural conflict. It's a financial conflict. And then the question is, how do I balance those things, right? And, and asking the question, how do I balance, of course, that's the wrong concept, as we talked about earlier. That's how. And asking that question, how, just makes it mountains and challenges, and all of a sudden, the last thing I want to do is deal with that. I just want to sit on the couch, and I want to decompress, and I want to sit there and read something or watch something on the TV and slam a bit numb to the reality of the situation. Uh, been there, right? Was there for many, many years. Yeah. And... Uh, and there's lots of ways to numb yourself, right? Whether it's the TV or, you know, sit there with four beers and finally after the fourth beer, you're like, okay, now. <laughs> right. Um, everybody's got their, their vehicle of choice to arrive at that state of, of calm after the chaos. The question, though, is, is there a better way? And if there is, who is living the better way? So the entire session that I'll be doing at RE shows examples of the ways in which you can create a lifestyle where you get paid to live the life that you want to live. And it's easier than people think. A lot easier. It's simply that we're surrounded by the majority of people who aren't doing it, and therefore that's what's filtering in your mind every day. That's what's locked into your unconscious and into your code. However, the more examples you start feeding your brain of ways in which people are getting paid to do what they love, the more that possibility starts to become like, oh, why am I not doing this, right? And so that session at RE, we're going to talk about that a great deal. Now, this, goes, this ties into so many of the points we talked about. If you're going to get paid to do something that you love, right, or if you're going to get paid to not work, then in essence, it's important to know a whole bunch of things, such as what's my purpose? What's my big five for life? Because if I want to get paid to be out there living my big five for life, I can't do that unless I know what my big five for life are. It's also very beneficial to understand the ways in which other who's are crafting that reality. So with my daughter, I say, what's the definition of a great job? Job that you love, Dad. What's a really great job? A job that you love and you make money while you sleep. Nice. Okay, so if you're not allowing yourself to connect with examples of who's who are getting paid while they sleep, then that is not even beginning to enter your possibility list. Right? And so these, I'll, I'll be walking people through a very uh, predictable and successful sequence of, of events which open up those possibilities. Another one is a great big asset list. Right? This is something from the, one of the other books that I co-authored with uh, Tim Brownson. And that is everybody has things in their background, their history, their skill sets that are great big assets. And this came about, the title in the chapter is You Have No But, You've Got a Great Big Asset. And it's because so many people would say to me, oh, I'd love to go travel the world, but I'd love to be an entrepreneur, but... Right. So finally, I was like, oh, that's a great chapter. You have no but. You've got a great big asset. question is, are you familiar with what those assets are? Do you understand the ways in which those assets can be put to good use? Have you taken the time to find somebody else with a similar great big asset who is using it to propel themselves in the direction that they want their life to go so that they make money while they sleep? This is all new territory for most people. I always tell when I'm speaking to 
college kids, I say, if I'd have known this when I was 18, like you are, like I'd have been free by the time I was 20. Yeah. You know, this is, it's not something that most people are, are given the opportunity to get familiar with or is in their periphery. So this will be a life change. I guarantee this will be a life changing uh, time at RE for a lot of people when they see, Oh my goodness, like that could be my life. John, I know we've got a couple minutes left and then you've got to run. And I want to, uh, two questions. The first is, um, uh, failure. What is the importance of failure in this process? And is failure potentially an asset? Failure is a great big asset. Uh, the world loves failures as long as the failure rises above, right? It's think of every great movie. There's a very predictable sequence of events that happen in that movie. It starts off with a character who says, I don't think I can do it. They get aware of a potential goal or opportunity or victory, right? Whether it's running a race or winning the football game or writing the manuscript or sailing around the world, whatever. And so they get a glimpse of this thing and they say, I can't do that, right? The fear is there. And there's a mentor or somebody else. This is a who. Right. person says, I believe in you. This is an example of it, right? And so there is a very predictable sequence of events. And these, the reason it shows up in the arts is because it's life. It's, it's art imitating life. And this is exactly the way that life happens for amazingly successful things. And uh, so this is the way it works. You can deal with all these aspects of fear. You can either let them bind you and control you, or you can let them go beyond. Or you can go beyond. So failure is the contrast that we need or the distance from it, uh, maybe the pain that encourages us to move around it and above it. So failure is important. It's critical. If you, the only reason that failure will kill you is if you let failure be the last thing that you did. If you get up off of the failure point and say, what did I learn from this experience? It's either, hey, this is not the path that I want to walk. So I've learned in the process that I really don't want to be in an RV, right? Uh, or it's where I've learned, oh, I'm not quite ready to be in the RV. I don't know, I don't know as much as I need to know to successfully navigate that experience. So the question is not how do I get that, but who is out there that already knows this? Um, so yeah, failure is a, a natural progression and kids are, kids are so wonderful at this. And then all of a sudden cultural conditioning starts to impact us as we age and all of a sudden failure is viewed as a bad thing, but you learn to walk, you learn to crawl by overcoming failure constantly, you know? And, and gosh, I had th thought of something before our call today and I'm trying to think of what it was. Oh, I know. I remember what it was. It fits perfectly into this. So we are conditioned with this concept of fight or flight. Right. Remember that? Yeah. So, oh, well, and, and we're conditioned in this because it says, well, in every given situation, we have this very reptilian concept or like very core to our animal instincts that says, okay, something just happened. Should I run or should I fight? Kev, of the thousands of things that happen to you every single day, do you really have to make those two choices usually? <laughs> right? No. no. Yeah. Right. It dawned on me this morning as I was thinking about our call. And so then the question is, well, if I don't have to be busy running or busy getting ready to do battle, what's the third option? Well, to me, as I thought about it, the third option is, what can I learn in this moment? I don't have to always be preparing to run away. Right. I don't always have to have my dukes up ready to fight when my adrenaline is coursing through my veins. Instead, I can say, oh, well, what can I learn from this experience? And to me, to your point about failure, that's exactly it. When I experience failure, I don't have to be running away. I don't have to be fighting. I can say, well, what can I learn from this so that I can continue in the direction of my personal big five for life? Yeah. Like Teresa Bressler, sit with it, soak it in and feel it, wear it, understand, right. learn from it, get to know it, get comfortable with it or not, you know, revel in the discomfort of, because that's part of the, the lesson learned. So the second part of that question. Um, I would say one part of that though, Kevin, that is that be very careful. Uh, I think it's absolutely awesome to sit with it, get comfortable with it and learn from it. Just be very careful that you don't make it your story. Oh, nice. All right. Story. The story, the story. Yeah. Because when you, how, how often do you experience that, right? You, so yeah. you, you meet someone and he says, how was your day today? And the first thing they want to talk about is the worst thing that happened. So they, they are taking that moment of failure and they are making that their story. And they know that's going to be the story that they tell because when they tell that story, everyone says, oh, I'm so sorry to hear about that. Cav, gosh, you know. I'm going to give you a pat on the back. I'll give you a hug. Uh, you know, I'm going to buy your lunch today. Be very careful with that because what that reinforces in the unconscious mind is that, well, when I live in this place of misery, people are nice to me. And if one of your values is that you want companionship or that you want community, 
you can get the unconscious mind will start convincing you that what you need to be doing is creating opportunities for you to fail so that you can tell everybody your story about failure and then everybody is nice to you. That's a wonderful point, John. It's like, I, I, uh, I love the clarity and the alive feeling I have after, you know, I've uh, visited a, a funeral or something like that, or I've, I've been a part of some like that story. I've been around that kind of story, but I don't want to live that story every day just to feel alive. Yeah. Awake, you know, uh, that, uh, clear about uh, how precious life is so that's a really good point um so the faith and fear uh the failure getting com getting comfortable with failure understanding its uh necessity and the potential for rising above it as a springboard into the next chapter uh helps with you know choosing the faith path over the fear path and um getting stuck in the fear path so I'm recapping this so I can get to my second question. The museum day. I don't know how much of that you want to share because uh, I know it's an important part of the book. Um, but I'm curious, in the museum day idea, where does failure, if you will, show up? In mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, I mean, what I'll do is, uh, so you've got the link to the museum day, so maybe just include that okay. with the description of this so that people want to watch it. Uh, Again, the, the failure is, it's only a negative thing if it's the last thing you do. Okay. If you don't get up off the floor, that's a problem. Um, if you don't get up off the floor and you make that your story, that's a problem. Uh, however, if you say that moment of failure is, I'm going to take that and learn from that and sit with it, as you said, and ask myself, not why is this happening to me, but okay, why is this happening? Right. And I can learn from that experience and I don't lose sight of the fact that there's more to life than just this moment of failure. That can open up the possibilities to do something far greater than you imagined. I mean, I have, I had a catastrophic failure point in my life uh, when I was in my early twenties, everything I had worked, I started working when I was 12 years old. I was carrying concrete blocks, which I weigh 155 pounds. Carrying concrete blocks is not the type of job. And back then I, I weighed about 110 pounds. Right. And so, uh, I've been working since I was 12 years old to save money so I could go to college, uh, get an education, and through a series of crazy circumstances, everything that I had worked for uh, was taken away from me. Everything. And it was through no fault of my own. I was diagnosed with a medical condition that I'd never been diagnosed before, and my dream was to be a pilot, and I found out that I could not be a pilot. Everything was taken away, right? And in that moment, my whole life had to shift. I had to change directions and it took me a year to sit with it and to figure it out and to finally get beyond my story. But in getting beyond my story, it opened up the next set of years, which opened up the possibility to go travel around the world, which opened up the possibility to write the first book. And now I live an amazing life, a life so much better than I had sort of mapped out and thought about as it would have been before. So, had I let that be the thing, I could have taken that moment when I was 21 and been like, life is cruel, it's unfair, like there's no fault of my own, and I could have just lived in that story for the rest of my life. That moment of failure could have been the defining moment in the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, but again, this goes to start kind of where we started, right? But if you can step back from it and you can say, this is going to open up something bigger. Yeah. And you can have faith, then, you know, the possibilities are sort of a lot, a lot, a lot bigger. Fantastic. John, I can't thank you enough, my friend. It's always a treat to spend time with you, whether you know we're together in person or online. This has been a, a gem as always. So thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to seeing you at RE 2015, September 4th through 7th in Little Rock, Arkansas. For those of you that haven't seen the ads yet, come on out, listen to John and a bunch of other terrific speakers, uh, share with us in activities and events, and have a blast. So thanks again, John. Appreciate it. Absolutely. My pleasure. So I'll make, I'm going to make an RE plug here because for some folks who are watching, they may not have the, the neural experience yet. So they may have had samples by going to the website. They may have watched a few videos. And so let me see if I can give an even bigger sample. So the question is, why would you go? You know, I mean, there's lots of things you can spend your time on so many different things. Why would you go to RE? Um, and so I'll give my own impression of that. My own impression is that every time I learn something, I open up my specter of possibilities to a degree that uh, I could not have imagined before. <clears throat> and there's a great quote that somebody once gave me. Um, as a matter of fact, 
so coincidental to our conversation. It's sitting around my desk. So there you go. So there you can see it on the screen. I'll read it to you. A mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original dimensions. When you go to RE, what happens is you stretch your mind and you start to meet who's who are doing things out there that are different than what you're doing. And they're not who's that are inaccessible. That's the whole great thing about RE. You're there with people, you get to know them as individuals and you can have sidebar conversations. You can sit in a session and then you can have dinner with a person. And then the next day your kids are playing together and you're riding in a canoe or whatever the case is. So you get to know people as people and that allows the unconscious mind to get to know what they're doing and who they are and the lives that they're living. And all of a sudden, the chance for your mind to expand just explodes. And so I think what I love most about the conference is it's real people. It's a genuine, fun, interesting experience. And you walk away and you look at life and what is possible in your own world in a totally different way. And I'm telling you, if you can get that once in your life, you're doing really good. And uh, Ari gives you the chance to get that over a whole bunch of days with really cool people. Well said. Thank you. That was our experience as well. Look forward <laughs> to sharing those four or five days with you again this year and your, and your wonderful family. So thanks for that uh, great recap of rethinking as well. All right, my friend. Appreciate the time today. Absolutely. Take care, Cap. Take care.